Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 15th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Today we have received apologies from Ross Greer and Oliver Mandel and uh, Alison Harris has joined us to substitute for Oliver this morning. Uh, can I remind everyone to please turn their mobile phones to silent during the course of the meeting. Our first agenda item is the third evidence session on the committee's subject choices inquiry. And delighted to welcome to committee this morning Lanny Flanagan, General Secretary of the EIS, Marjorie Kerr, President of the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers, Katrina McPhee, Chair of the Gaelic Secondary Teachers Association, Tess Watson, Field Officer for the Association of Science Education, and Francisco Valdera Gill, representative of the Scottish Council of Deans of Education of Modern Languages subgroup. A uh, very warm, warm welcome to you all. Um, I'd just like to open by asking you just to, to give a little bit of flavour of, um, I know we have received submissions, but a little bit about um, what your experience of the, the new curriculum has been. And I'd like to open with Ms McPhee. Madin va, as Misha Katrina Yikifi, as Sammy and Shock, as Rech, a teacher in Gaelic, on the Scotch and for its fake Naduke, at the Nehelanen, Egis Balchan Mora, Scotch and Bigger, Legidoch and Teacher Ante, Good Lan Scotch and Trigo Och Jig. Lishishin, and a triplage in a hagging year, Gamad Jifricha Urnan. Koyu, Hami Glehain Gal Evi, and Shot and Jew, Egis and Coromain Machan and Heen Evreen. Um, ach is gas nachil gaelic ek gach dinje em um, gmi ostenach kan im in course of yearle gis in tikshif ma viachken em um, mari yearing heen um, i was just saying good morning i'm katrina mcfee and i'm here to represent gaelic teachers from schools across the country from island communities to the big cities from smaller schools with one just one gaelic teacher to a uh, full 3 to 18 gaelic schools as such the problems that we face are sometimes quite different I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be here today speaking my own language. However, since there are many here that uh, don't have Gaelic, unfortunately, the rest of my responses will be in English so that my opinions will come across as I would like. I'll finish our summary by, of our position by saying that despite the problems um, that we have, we are almost without exception in agreement that the narrowing of subject choices in many Scottish schools has had a profoundly negative effect on the uptake of Gaelic, especially, but not exclusively, that of Gaelic learners. The figures have proved this with numbers in the last five years of Gaelic learners um, having been reduced by, by 57% in the last five years. It does need urgent intervention to protect Gaelic itself, Gaelic education, and most relevant today, the right of Scotland's young people to learn Gaelic in their schools. We may indeed be the smallest subject here today, but we are by no means small in terms of our importance to history, culture, identity. And in that sense, we are so much more than a school subject or an option on a form. It is crucial to us today that changes are hopefully made for the better after this consultation. Thank you. Um, Mr. Valdera Gill. Eh, buenos días. No voy a hablar en español. Don't worry, I'm not going to speak in Spanish. Eh, so I was a teacher at Alkid High, not far from here, Spanish, French, and I work at eh, Teacher Education, University of Glasgow, and I'm here representing modern language teachers, but on behalf of the Scottish Council of Deans of Education, the Modern Languages Subgroup. And uh, this, um, you, you've already heard the evidence of the detrimental effect of the narrowing of uh, course choices of modern languages. Uh, we believe that this is an unintended consequence of of the policy. Uh, if, if you look back at 2008 at the consultation on the new qualifications, uh, this was predicted by then, back then. Um, some councils put um, anticipated that that could happen to modern languages with uh, the reduction of course choices in fourth year. And um, I, can, I can cite um, uh, evidence from a, from a 2018 paper um, says that but EU comparisons, UK provisions for modern languages, education is poor, with only 5% of students studying two or more languages compared to the EU average of 51%. This is Eurostat statistics for 2016. And the highest percentage of students in upper secondary school, 57% of 
who do not study a language. This is UK for nations, but you've already seen evidence that in Scotland, 65 there's been a 65 downtrend in uptake of languages in, in S4. And I think, as Katjuna has said, this is about uh, positioning ourselves as an outward nation in the light of the dangers of Brexit. And this is not just the numbers of subjects that pupils take in fourth year, but this is the wider implications of building interculturality in, in our nation. We're not saying that we're the only subject which does that in modern language, in, in, in the curriculum, but uh, language is a more tangible expression of identity and for people to show uh, that approach towards the other. So it's, it, it, it's really important and I'm very thankful for the committee to have invited me to represent the views of modern languages teachers uh, because the morale uh, is low in modern languages, amongst modern languages teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kerr. My name is Marjorie Kerr. I'm president of the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers. Um, we are an entirely voluntary charitable organisation with a membership of around 600 geography teachers throughout Scotland. Um, personally, I've been a geography teacher for 38 years and seen many changes in the curriculum during that time. Um, I started off teaching O-grade, um, saw in the changes, moved to standard grade and was actually part of the CFE pro process um, as a member of the geography curriculum design group. Um, I've also done a two-year secondment in Education Scotland where I was a social subjects development officer and at the moment I'm principal teacher of geography in a school in Dundee. So I feel I do have a wide um, breadth of knowledge to talk about subject choice. Um, as an organisation, when we heard about the subject choice inquiry, we did as we have done before and conducted a survey and many of you have probably read the results of our survey. Um, it was not a good time of year for teachers as they were involved in setting and marking prelim exams. So we only had 85 responses, which is very low in terms of the response that we would normally get to a survey. But we did, however, feel it was still worthwhile submitting it for your perusal. And the main recommendations that we made were a return to a consistent 222 model across the country. Um, in particular, we're concerned about the um, variation in the, um, the SQA exams and um, you know, the assignment, the removing of the assignment, which takes up too much teaching, reduces learning time, causes teacher and pupil stress and is open to abuse, varies widely in level of demand. Um, we would also like to see a requirement to keep breadth up to S4 um, of at least seven or eight subjects. And we are also very keen to see the teaching of subjects from S1 onwards being um, led by a subject specialist to ensure rigour, challenge and progression. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Watson. I'm Tess Watson. Um, I am the Field Officer for Scotland for the Association of Science Education. Um, the ASE is um, a, a large body uh, within England with a smaller um, membership within Scotland. Um, I've only actually been in post just over a year, so I'm still finding my feet with, with the ASE. Um, I'm involved with a number of talks with other learning societies, um, the Royal uh, Society of Biology, Royal Society of Chemistry and the Institute of Physics. Um, we regularly meet uh, up at the Royal Society in Edinburgh to discuss uh, strategies and um, ad advice and views uh, for panels such as, as yourselves. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, I've been working in education for 20 years now. Um, I'm a biology teacher and I have been seconded twice. I was seconded firstly at Murray House to work on um, a project which enabled distance learning for young people who'd be travelling or were in hospital or forces children, um, allowing them to access their learning anytime, anywhere. Um, I subsequently did a postgraduate degree in digital education uh, at Murray House um, before returning to the classroom. Um, my job just now, I gave up a permanent job in order to pursue freelance work. Um, I am with the ASE point two of a week, but that does vary. Um, I teach on the PGD science at Murray House. This is my second year teaching there. And um, I also teach in schools right throughout East Lothian when I'm not at Murray House or doing um, Association of Science Education things. 
to, to bring it down to uh, STEM subjects, I'm obviously very passionate about STEM. Um, it's the two biggest themes in, in education, I feel just now, are STEM and sustainability. Um, there's a lot of discussions on um, attracting, retaining uh, science teachers. Um, so I will be feeding forward um, from the ASE. A lot of the stuff that you will hear from me today may well be a duplicate to William Hardy, who I think um, was on the previous panel. Um, he's with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, and my understanding is that um, if it was appropriate, I could uh, give you my view with my Murray House hat or um, my school teacher hat. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Farnigan. Um, well, good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, I'm General Secretary of the EIS. I was a classroom teacher for 33 years. Um, as a PT uh, English, I'll, I'll be speaking in Scots um, for the, the remainder of the session. Um, uh, I've been paying attention to the, the previous sessions, uh, and earlier uh, this morning we also heard the use of the phrase uh, unintended consequence, um, which I think is true, um, but it was not unforeseen. Um, and some of us have been warning that where we are now uh, with the senior phase um, is well short of the ambition of CFE. And that ambition, when it was articulated, was around maintaining breadth across the, uh, the senior phase of the school, creating space for depth of learning, because that was one of the criticisms of our previous system, that we got kids through exams, but we didn't actually give them the depth of understanding, which were linked into the skills of the 21st century that uh, OECD were advocating um, uh, jurisdictions should engage with. Uh, and also, in particular, that there should be parity of esteem between vocational and, uh, inverted commas, academic. So if those were the three kind of yardsticks, where we are at the moment is well short of that. Uh, and we are dealing with uh, a system which is still in transition. When CFE was first developed, and when the senior phase in particular was being looked at, we were conscious that standard grade had actually been um, a well-trusted system. Interestingly, all of the professional associations in the consultation on the new qualifications advocated retaining standard grade and upgrading it, refreshing it. Um, but that wasn't part of the options. So we were moving into a new qualification system. Standard grade had been introduced in the 80s as certification for all. And one of the key issues then was that the demographic was the majority of students left school after fourth year. So standard grade uh, was, a, was a, a huge success um, over the 20 years. But as you've heard in previous sessions, we now have a situation where the demographic is around 90% of our pupils are staying on to fifth year. And the qualification system we had in place with standard grade and then intermediates in higher, the higher still programme it was a confused landscape for a lot of these students who were staying on. So quite often students in fifth year were doing int one and int two, which was a repeat of the standard grade qualification already had. It was just a different way of assessing it. Um, and that was part of the drive around our system at that point was obsessed with qualifications. And it was obsessed with qualifications because that was the benchmark against which schools were judged. So as a teacher, if you had a certificate, any kind of certificate class, your primary function was to get them through the qualifications with the best result possible. Um, and the SQA uh, had its tariff points, and the inspector would come in, and they would ask for your results, and they would judge your school on your results. Now, that had led to a shallower experience in terms of learning for our young people. Uh, and the senior phase was meant to open up a different approach, uh, where we were actually looking at the learning that was taking place in equal value to the outcome in terms of the qualification. So that's why the idea of breadth and depth and parity of esteem became the kind of benchmark. Now, we're not, we're not there, uh, we're absolutely not there, and the colleagues from the subject specialisms uh, in particular will articulate the threat to their subjects that the current arrangements have. I think what we have to consider is 
do we still have the same ambition around the senior phase? And if so, how do we get there? Um, or are we going to abandon it and go back to the old system, which was largely two plus two plus two? But if we go back to that, I think we'll have done a disservice because we will not have addressed the idea of the kind of learning that needs to take place for our young people to be equipped for the, the century in which they live. And, and, and my last point um, is just to make this point. Curriculum for Excellence was not meant to be a change to our qualifications. Curriculum for Excellence was meant to be a pedagogical change about the way that we facilitated learning for our young people. And it was predicated on the idea of young people had to have more than just qualifications, they had to have a skill set that made them resilient in an ever-changing market in the 21st century. And that's where that space for depth of learning uh, was, was meant to pitch itself. But implementation of the senior phase has left us some way short um, of that ambition. Uh, and I think if we're looking at subject choice, we also have to look at these, big, these broader uh, objectives and put subject choice into that particular framework. Um, and I'll leave it there because I'm sure there'll be specific questions to follow up. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, now invite members to ask questions. I'm going to open with Miss Lamont. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I've already found everything that's been said um, very interesting. One of the areas that I am interested in, I think Larry Flanagan kind of highlights this dilemma about fourth year for a, for a generation of teachers who taught non-certificate classes, who therefore got no resources, who got basically nothing. Standard grade was a liberation, and it wasn't really the credit kids, it was foundation general, because these were young people who were now being treated sufficiently seriously to have an external examination. And I hear what you're saying about the logic around how that would change. But I wonder, first of all, do you agree there is a concern that for a lot of young people, there is no external examination, and therefore there are consequences in terms of the resources that goes to them? And last week we heard from... Um, on the issue of looked after children, 75% of whom leave at the end of fourth year. And unless we go along with the Tory position that everybody has to stay in school to they're 18, I think there will always be young people who want to make that choice. Some of them are not, you know, it's their, their circumstances perhaps, or an active choice. How do we ensure that there is something um, in the system that, that externally validates young people who will be leaving at fourth year? That kind of the best of what standard grade was. How do we address that when I recognise the young people will be staying in some circumstances staying on to sixth year and really end up not doing terribly much in that time that's progressing and, and deepening their understanding? Well, one of the things that's supposed to happen with um, the senior phase uh, is that a significant subject choice is supposed to happen in S3. Now, that's not the reality, because the majority of schools still do subject choice in S2. Uh, so they're still kind of leaning more towards standard grade, post-16 qualifications than uh, thinking about BGE in the senior phase. But at the point where that subject choice is supposed to happen, there's supposed to be an S3 profile. And this was a hugely contested area when CFE was being developed. Um, you know, some people have never heard of it, uh, the S3 profile. What that is supposed to do, it is supposed to set out for the young person at age 15 a three-year pathway, irrespective of whether that young person is leaving school or not. So schools are responsible for having uh, a, a pathway for young people to the, to the age of 18. And if the young person is leaving school um, at age 16, they might well in fourth year actually be out of school already and be doing college courses. But they have to have a pathway set out for them it takes them through to 18, predicated on the idea of um, a, a positive uh, destination. Now, within that, I think, uh, and I understand the point, there's still a debate uh, you know, around N4 and whether there should be an external qualification. But for a lot of the young people who are leaving, um, that's not necessarily the, the qualification that best suits their, their career intentions. So in colleges, for example, a lot of the courses that are offered uh, many of them SQA courses don't have external qualifications. They're internally validated within the college, uh, and the college uh, validation process is then moderated by um, SQA. 
Uh, so if they were doing an apprenticeship, for example, there's not an external exam around an apprenticeship. And if that's the best pathway for a young person leaving school at 16, then I don't think you should artificially have uh, an external examination attached to it. Um, that's not to say I don't think there's a debate around N4, because that's been part for the last 18 months. Um, and, you know, within our members, there is divided opinion. A lot of people think an external exam would give N4 uh, added uh, validity in the eyes of parents and pupils. Um, I certainly think the N4 has to have at least two levels of pass, because a minimal pass, which is the current arrangement, is actually a, it's, it's a general grade four, um, whereas before we had general grade three and four, and they were quite different. If you had a grade four, you did uh, an int one. If you had a grade three, you did an int two. So a, a threshold past the N4 is not a good preparation for N5, for example. Um, and we have been arguing that there should be at least by uh, by level uh, validation at N4. Uh, there's still a debate of whether that's an external exam or whether it's through some kind of external validation of an internal process. Uh, and I think we have to take that forward. What, what I would get, you know, guard against is the idea that the pathway that should be there for all young people is you get your N4 or equivalent, and then you get your N5 or equivalent, and then you get your higher, and then you get your advanced higher. Um, we do support the idea of schools for the majority of people should be focusing on exit qualifications um, and working towards making sure that that depth and breadth is there around the exit qualifications. Um, it can't be universal because a lot of young people uh, will, will benefit from step-by-step step step approaches around qualifications. Uh, so there has to be some flexibility. I think, I think the challenge that we have at the moment is that there's a whole range of practice for different reasons across, across the system. Um, and there's a reluctance to impose a pattern on schools because that would seem to be taking the decision out of schools' hands. Um, but unless you give some clearer direction, schools, will, schools you know, by and large, have been uh, attached to the qualifications pathway model. Right? And there's been no drive from anyone to move them away from that. Education Scotland, up until its recent reboot, basically shied away from the question. So, so for the, the five years that we're introducing these new qualifications, you couldn't get a statement from Education Scotland to say you should think about bypassing, right? Because they just let the system run uh, as it had done. And that's one of the reasons why we're at this kind of crossroads. Uh, I think from here, we have to think about how we move forward. Um, and I don't think we move forward by moving back the way uh, in terms of you know the standard grade practice that was there. Uh, despite the fact that that was probably our most successful qualification in the last 40 years. I suppose the question I'm still wrestling with myself is this question of equity, because there was a change in schools at the point where schools had to take seriously youngsters who were doing foundation in general, had to put resources into it. The young people got to go and study leave. They were, you know, they might know themselves what the different abilities people had, but that sense of being part of the same experience in some ways to me was... That's very important. And I, I don't know if you share my concern that some of the evidence we've had suggests that those who are most disadvantaged are more disadvantaged still now under what's happening, whether it's intended or not, but what's happening um, in the process. And that's why I flagged up the issue of looked after children, because if 75% of looked after children are leaving in fourth year, that is not because all of those young people would more appropriately do a vocational course or go to college is because the circumstances have led them to be in a position where no matter what their academic ability, they're not able to make that decision to stay on. And I wonder whether, in, is that an issue? And how do we address this challenge of the people who are going to get five hires, make it five hires anyway. And what you do with the middle, there's all sorts of arguments about depth. But there are, a, I think, a group of young people who are not being served well by that the process and how do we deal with that because I think I'm a bit worried I have a concern that there's an almost like a, an HR convenience model coming through that if you want to create space in the curriculum these are the bits of the system that not really address the needs of all that many but I think a particularly important group that then allows them to do other things how do you manage that so it is genuinely being driven by educational need and interest and ability 
rather than some kind of management process? Well, well, I, think there is I think there is an issue there, um, and N4 is an interesting focus because it's kind of cusp between the expected norm. So level three by the end of S3 is the minimal requirement. The ambition is for most people to be at N, the N4 equivalent CFE level four by the end of S3. But below N4, we have N1, 2, and 3, and they don't have external exams. Uh, in the old system, we had access 1, 2, and 3, and they didn't have inter internal exams. And these were all designed to meet the needs of students for whom external exams would have added pressure uh, and could actually debar them from getting a qualification. Now, around the N4, uh, we do have this kind of uh, dual target group. There are people who are doing N4 um, as a stepping stone to N5, and there are people who are doing N4 as a sort of plateau of their, their school achievement and looking to then map into other qualifications. Uh, so I, so I, I, mean, I, I don't diminish the debate around it because I think it's a very real debate. Um, I, I don't think N4 as it currently stands, currently operates, um, is a good progression route to N5. Um, I do think if N4 has been used as a uh, an exit qualification uh, for young people who are going on to different pathways, uh, then it can be made to work. Um, and I don't think the absence of an external exam uh, should be the default criticism, because it should really be about what are the assessment needs of those young people. But at the moment, we're trying to deal with a quite a, a wide range of uh, requirements around what N4 is doing, and I don't think our current model um, is straddling the two ambitions which is why I think the, the discussions, are, and I, th I think there is a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks to kind of revisit uh, N4. Um, I think that's it's quite important because I think um, for, young, some, for some young people, uh, the N4 um, is almost an incidental stepping stone, um, which doesn't actually prepare them well, which is why you get a lot of N4 candidates who don't get their N5 because they actually haven't, you know, they're, they're borderline N4 passes rather than aspiring N5 passes. So I think that's that's one of the uh, kind of wicked issues that we still have to resolve around how these qualifications work. But specifically in the question of a group like looked after children, what do, what do we do about that? I mean, that if, yes, most young people will now stay on to sixth year, but there's, there are young people who are disadvantaged in the system already. What do we do to the, the how do we address that question? So, within the, within the look after and accommodated children, um, there's a wide range of ability. So, the, the, you know, the kids in there who are uh, perfectly capable of getting higher, whether they choose to do that or not. Yeah. And, and they're, uh, quite often they're leaving school, not necessarily because of mm -hmm. dissatisfaction with the school, but because of personal circumstance. The school has a responsibility to have a three-year three path lane for those uh, young people. Um, and if uh, N5, for example, were an appropriate qualification for that pathway, then they should be looking to make sure that those young people are going to college to achieve that. Um, if N4 was, a, was a, an appropriate pass, then what is the next step after N4? Because there's no point in saying N4 should have an external exam if that doesn't make any difference to the next step for that young person. Um, I think the reason that uh, around, the issues around looked after and accommodated um, are less to do with uh, the qualifications system and more to do with the social circumstance in which we actually support young people, some of whom will still be very vulnerable, uh, through to the age of 18, um, you know, when they'll be, well, they're making their own decisions at 16, but, you know, when they were um, uh, less supported by the, by the system. Um, just a, a brief um, question on that, that line of questioning. We, we know that um, some um, pupils in less advantaged areas are only being offered a subject choice of five at higher. Can I have your view on that? And do you not think that limits their, their chances, their life chances? Well, at, at higher, um, very few schools will offer more than five hires um, as a subject choice because higher in the previous system and for most schools in this system is a one-year course and you cannot fit more than five times 160 hours into a school year. So if schools are offering six hires over one year, 
they're creating an impossible burden on young people. But I, I didn't. That's. I understand why you're saying that. I didn't frame the question properly. There, there been, that's the, the, the senior phase limitation of their, their choices. It's not necessarily just for hire. Well, um, no, that is, that is ridiculously narrow. Um, and six subjects in S4 um, is, is narrow as well. Um, the, so the issue is how you overcome that. So you, know, you, you can overcome it by going back to your 2 plus 2 plus 2 model. Or you can do what some schools are doing and actually planning across S4, S5 as a two-year course. If you do S4, S5, you have eight columns. So, sorry, I was at school timetable as well, so you, know, you, may have, you may have to suffer this. So you have, you have eight columns and you can offer eight subjects. Um, now, I would say not, not eight qualifications, but eight subjects. Um, and that's one of the ways that you were, it was intended that breadth was maintained. And if you do eight subjects across two years, then you have more than 160 hours to complete the course. I think, I think we're just into double figures the number of schools who are doing that because most schools, primarily because the change from standard grade to N4, N5 happened over a summer, most schools simply replaced standard grade with N4, N5 and maintained their curriculum timetables because that was the only way that schools could cope with it it was the only way that pupils could cope with it. Um, so we got off to a bad start in terms of, you know, looking at curricular structures. And I think it's only now you've got SQA and Education Scotland uh, and Scottish Government um, saying, that, saying that the same thing around exit qualifications and looking at a three-year experience, um, which I think is the way forward rather than, you know, reverting to a, a model um, which was designed for a different age. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Fadel and then I'll come to Ms. Kerr. Going to jo Joanne Lamont's question about uh, looked after and accommodated children and, and them being disadvantaged in schools. I, I also had many hats. I also was uh, acting there before a year for pupil support. And I think there are is what Larry was saying there about the range of practice and the clear direction and every school doing what they can. But there are, there are schools that have alternative curriculums where these pupils who have a lot of social emotional problems, they are looked after within the school in another way to help them stay in school. So is, 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 is looking at what these young people need at that time to support them. So um, in the school where I taught, we had about 200 students doing an alternative curriculum path since second year. And this was done in, 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 in conjunction with, with social work. So there are, there are places around the country that would take a different approach. But an issue is, and, and again, is linked to what Larry was saying before, is, and, and part of your inquiry is the multi-level multi teaching when you have classes of national three, four, and five, and um, the, the pressures on attainment, because very often, the, the, very often pupils and management take uh, choices of putting courses into the choice based on the attainment of, the, of those courses. So this has an impact on teachers that very often concentrate more on national five students where National 3 and National 4, maybe they're just um, maybe not so much resources put into them. So um, just before I went to university, I had a National 4, 5, higher and advanced higher class, all in the same column. So the, the, there are teachers preparing for, for four classes, uh, for the one class. So this has an effect on, on the children that are most disadvantage. So I, I know people will come on to this question in more depth later, but do you think that's a particular issue for modern languages? It has been a particular issue for modern languages since the, since modern languages in fourth year stopped being uh, compulsory. Um, in the school where I taught, we had seven fourth year classes in 2013. Attainment was very good, 14, 15, parents got letters saying we really advise your son or your daughter to take a national five in French. But now there's maybe one class in one column that 
has children from S4, S5, and S6 doing national four, five, or higher in the same column. So the fact that there are, is, is, that, is that dilemma in between the range of choice and, uh, and what schools can do with the resource and teachers that they have. So in some subjects, this has an impact where you've got a lot of different levels in the, in the, in the same class. Your sense that that's increasingly the norm. So it's not just about managing shortage of teachers, but it's freeing up space in the curriculum. So, well, it's now become accepted. We can have multi-level in French, and that just creates space elsewhere for other subject choices. I, I, I think it has, in, in, in language, it has come to that because it has tops being compulsory. And also because if you're only taking five, six, or seven subjects, the, the one that has dropped the most in S4, 65% by seal statistics has been modern languages. So um, that's what, you know, that, that's the dilemma I had to, a, as a teacher, you know. Uh, there's three kids that want to do national four, so teachers would say, okay, I, I'll take them, because otherwise you know that these children are not, um, are not going to study the language. So it, 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 the issue has been the narrowing that students have less can take less less subjects. Ms. Okay, if you want to go, and I'll, I'll come to you, Ms. Watson, in a minute. Uh, yeah, there was just a couple of things so far that have been mentioned. We've talked a little bit about the national four course and how it's not um, certificated. One of the issues that we feel is that um, parents are not well enough educated yet on the courses that are being provided. So. Um, we find that in some schools that when pupils are asked to do National 4, um, the parents won't accept it for the reason that there is no qualification because people have still not got um, sorted out in their heads how the new qualifications work. They think that you have to have an examination at the end um, because that's what employers want. And there's still a fair bit of education, I think, to go on, not just with teachers. I think they know what they're doing, but, you know, with parents. Um, for instance, in my school, we have pupils who maybe get 20% in a prelim exam, and we say that not, they will not manage to pass a National 5 examination, and yet the parents want them to set that qualification. Nibble? Mm -hmm. yeah. And would, you, would the solution, therefore, to give them confidence that to externalise the N4 exam? I think there has to be something done about it to make it um, a more realistic qualification. Yes, definitely. And um, the other thing I wanted to say was that, I mean, the whole thing about the... Um, BGE and senior phase as well has was done the wrong way around. Um, people thought it was a good idea to start in S1 and change the curriculum up the way. You were changing things for first, second and third year before we actually knew what the new qualifications were going to be. Um, so you didn't really know what was ahead. Um, and so that made it extremely difficult. And so we are now working in a system where the people are having to change their BGE to relate to what is there in the senior phase. And I think that's one of the things that is an issue and causing um, a problem because we just can't get away from constantly having to change things every year. Ms. Watson? I just want to come back to the point um, uh, you raised about looking after and accommodated children. Um, my feeling, absolute gut feeling, is that these youngsters are only in school for eight out of 24 hours a day and there's only so much that as, as practitioners that we can do. Um, I think early intervention is, is the key to this. Um, youngsters that I've seen go through secondary school, if there's been early intervention at primary school, the success rate of them staying on and gaining further qualifications is far more likely. I understand that, but nevertheless, despite that, and of course you'd want to make sure that all young people achieve their full potential, but there, are, there is simply a, a, um, st stats that show 75% of young people who are looked after end up leaving in fourth year. And in order to not reinforce further the inequality they face, um, I suppose my question was whether the way the current curriculum is set up is compounding the problem. 
and that is that we, if you have a system that's predicated never been there for three years, and you can establish that there's a significant group of young people who will not be there for three years, whether we want them to be or not, how do we not make it worse for them by having a system that doesn't acknowledge that they're going to go at the end of fourth year? I don't, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question, actually, because I, I don't have an answer on that. Except it's, it's far beyond just the curriculum. I suppose my question, I think we probably rehearsed it fully, which is whether what we're doing is um, amplifying some of the inequalities when there's some things we could do to actually help diminish it. I think if we were actually looking at um, you know, the three-year plan for young people, that would be a significant improvement on the previous system because under standard grade, a lot of these kids would have left at the end of fourth year as well. And as soon as they were out the door, the school was finished with them. Now, that shouldn't be the case now. The school should actually have an interest in those young people for the next three years of their lives um, and try to ensure that they're on a, a pathway to a sustained, a positive destination. So I think the, I mean, I, I understand the problem you're highlighting. Um, I don't think the qualification system is making that worse. In fact, I think there, are, there is potential within the system for a better arrangement than we had previously. Um, because a lot of these young people in the past wouldn't have left with, with you know, high-level standard grades. They'd have been leaving with foundation awards. Um, and as soon as we were out of school, the school was finished with them. That's not supposed to be the situation now. So there's at least some scope for you know, looking at the issue more positively. Look at how schools actually do carry out the responsibility yeah. to see young people who have left. I hadn't realised that, so that might be yeah. something we could investigate further. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Mr Gray. Um, it kind of follows on from that. I mean, I'm quite interested in a number of things uh, you've said, Larry. You said curriculum for excellence was not a change to qualifications. It was a change to the curriculum, but it didn't necessarily mean the qualifications could change, although we chose to do that, or the government at the time chose to do that. You said standard grade was the most successful qualification for 40 years. It was kind of heartwarming for the three or four of us in the room who I think were involved in developing standard grade, but, but I think true. You said that um, the EIS and other professional associations' advice at the time was not to change standard grade, but to, ref to refresh it, um, renew it. And we also know that the change that has been made to qualifications, and we've heard this evidence this morning and other days, is having unintended consequences, including potentially squeezing some subjects out of the curriculum and out of schools altogether. I just and I understand why people want to say we should move forwards, not back, but is that not a pretty powerful argument for just saying we've made a mistake here? And actually, we should go back to something that, that worked so well. Certainly, at the round table that the committee held with teachers in Fife, that was generally the view that they took. I suppose it depends on whether you think in 2020 um, a solution from the 1980s is appropriate. Um, we are, are, you know, I think we're all on board with our young people uh, are facing challenges beyond school in the 21st century that you know we didn't face when we were at school. And that was what underpinned the idea of the curricular reform, was the fact that we had to have, you know, and it's, it's a very, it's a, bit, it's a bit clumsy to talk about 21st century skills, but it was this idea that um, it's not enough just to have qualifications. Young people are not going to be in jobs for life, they're going to have to be adaptable and resilient. Um, and our system, which was predicated on qualifications, it was being criticised for not delivering on that broader agenda. So we had universities saying, kids are coming up here with A passes and they don't know how to learn. Right? And universities running first year remedial courses to try and get kids into learning skills. So that was the kind of context we were looking at. Now, at the time of the standard grade discussion, um, I, I was still in school, I was EIS education convener, I was going around doing a lot of meetings where a lot of our members were unconvinced about the whole thing. Um, and I was saying, if you want to achieve the ambition of CFE, uh, if you left the qualifications as they were, but changed the way that we taught, we would end up closer to the ambition 
than if we changed the qualifications, but just kept teaching the same way. Now, we have changed the qualifications, but pretty much largely in, in the upper secondary school, still teach the same way, because we're still teaching kids to get through qualifications. Um, and all of this broader agenda is getting squeezed out, because if you have, if you have a, an N5 class uh, doing, their, doing their course in one year, then you have the two-term dash to N5 that we used to criticise around higher. Uh, and getting through the course content in a, in a single year is a significant challenge for teachers and pupils. So you do then start not teaching to the test, but you, do, you are focused on the assessment. Because if these kids spend a year in your class and none of them pass their N5, somebody's going to trap your door and ask you what's going on. So that is, that is why our system is still geared towards you know, this qualification framework. And that bigger ambition, and you know, there was a point made about parental issues. So my old school, where I left them the timetable, Nobody sits exams in S4. They do eight subjects across in S4 and S5. And every year, there has to be a meeting with parents to explain why you're doing it. And when you, start, when you talk about depth of learning and breadth, and the fact that kids can actually get six hires rather than five, they don't need to drop art, they don't need to drop music, they don't need to drop um, uh, uh, languages, you know, they don't need to just focus on their five, then we've managed to persuade the parents. But the majority of parental opinion still thinks in terms of their own experience, which is qualifications. Um, so I, now I'm really tempted to say, right, let's just go back and pretend it didn't happen. Right? But, but it has happened. And actually going back to that previous system, we would end up in a poorer place. Because one of the huge criticisms I would make of SQA was they were charged with designing in the new qualifications the best of standard grade. And the best of standard grade was no one fell through the net. So because kids sat credit general, general foundation, um, across grades one to seven, they all settled, or got a qualification. That's why it was certification for all. Part of the, the, the reason why schools are reluctant to embrace the two-year courses is because you then have to make sure you put kids into the right course, right qualification at the end of it. Otherwise, you know, as, as happened in Hermitage, Kids will set higher exams and have nothing to show because SQA did not design fall back into the system. N4, N5 uh, and higher uh, are all discrete qualifications. And if you set the wrong one, um, you could end up with nothing, which is why a lot of schools like to get money in the bank in S4, get your N5 done, uh, at least you've got that to fall back on. Let, let me come back to that in a second, but I'm quite interested to hear what the other panel, how tempted the rest of the panel are to say, let's just go back to standard grade. I wouldn't be much as though I do think it did work. I, I agree with Larry wholeheartedly that the world is not the same and we would be doing our young people a disservice if we went back to a system where we're using different skills, different um, abilities, experiences by far. So although it is tempting, it, it, it would be unfair to them because they are not the young people that, that existed 20 years ago. I'd also like to come back just now to something to, um, that Fran had mentioned about the specific impact on languages when you're looking at dropping down to five subjects and how that is um, squeezing very often languages out. There is another issue with that that uh, is the word viability, when across schools um, that uh, subjects are being told that if you don't have a threshold number of pupils that do accept a subject, that that subject can no longer actually be, be selected, and therefore it's put to one side. And what, what you have a danger of then is that you are marginalising smaller subjects and only making sure that it's the bigger subjects with um, lots of uptake that are, that are taken on. And certainly for Gaelic, I, I know there's languages as well, but for Gaelic specifically, we are in a critical position where we really do need every single child that wishes to take Gaelic that has that opportunity. Now, I actually had um, three schools contact me in the last week um, talking of um, a concern when their schools had said that there, there were no threshold numbers, there, there, were, there weren't enough numbers opting for, the, for Gaelic learners to take that subject. Now, the numbers over those three schools, you're looking at approximately 20 children. Now, when we have 107 children having done N5 Gaelic last year, 20 children in even three schools could make a huge difference. Now, if we actually looked across the country, if there was, if there was a situation, whether it's a couple of pupils here and there, that could turn our situation around. And it's, it's 
wrong to ignore that and not to make sure that there's something in place to monitor schools stopping the provision of something, especially like Gaelic, just because they feel that the numbers aren't viable. Gaelic itself, unfortunately, our numbers aren't great just now. We don't have the luxury to wait till we have 20 people waiting to do our subject or sometimes even 10. So it does need intervention and we'd be very welcome if that happened. Yes, Miss Watson. Mm -hmm. Can I just also mention, and I don't know if my colleagues would agree, um, what happens or can happen is that youngsters are then shoehorned into subjects which weren't their first choices, which then you have youngsters that have no enthusiasm for the subject, they've been shoehorned into it, therefore you end up with a situation where you know it's not, not positive. Um, it is worth noting that that, that does, I, I don't know, does that, that happen in other schools? teachers, their evidence is pretty strong. They would like to go back to what we had before, no? Well, not necessarily um, go back to the old standard grade system. I think one of the things is that, I mean, we're now being asked to be far more creative in the classroom. And um, we're being asked to do things like cooperative learning. We're being asked to teach the pupils skills um, so that they're more able to um, be part of society. Um, Larry mentioned the two-term dash. It's very, very difficult to do all these things that we're being asked to do in that time because we're trying to teach the pupils um, what, what is in the National Five Geography Qualification. Um, but, you know, we're also being asked to try and do it in a different way, um, which is the way that we want to do it. Um, so I think there is um, a lot of different things on the table here. Well, let's go back to that two-term dash because, um, again, in the, the roundtable focus groups that we had um, in, in Fife the other day, I mean, myself and Mr Allen sat at a table with, I don't know, 10 or a dozen teachers, and it sounded as if every school they taught in had a different curricular structure. And um, a lot of those were having the effects that we've been concerned about reducing the breadth of the curriculum and so on. Um, so Larry, you described there a model which you made the case allowed for that um, breadth to continue in the curriculum, but with the, the new qualifications. But the problem that we have is when Education Scotland came to give evidence and they were asked about this, they said, well, the curriculum, curricular structure in the schools up to the school. That's empowering schools. That's so the result is that apart from a handful of schools, it would appear decisions have been made which have actually narrowed the curriculum. There's only a handful of schools, you said maybe less than double figures, who've actually found a curricular structure that makes this work and maintains the breadth. So should we not have Education Scotland or someone saying, this is the curriculum, this is how it works, and this is how you have to deliver it in your school so that these unintended consequences don't happen? Well, I think um, Education Scotland now um, is in a different place from where it was a couple of years ago um, around that kind of messaging. Uh, we argued with Education Scotland over you know, the length of its existence up until uh, its recent reboot that it was failing to lead on curriculum architecture. You know, in terms of timetable structures, uh, and that we weren't suggesting that every school should absolutely have to do the same. So, if you're, you know, if you're in a scheme school in Glasgow and half your kids are leaving at the end of uh, fourth year, then having two-year courses across the S4, S5 is totally inappropriate. Um, if you've got a, a different kind of mix, then you might have to have a mixture of two-year courses and one-year courses. So, at Hillhead, if kids were leaving at the end of uh, fourth year, they would do um, five subjects, five qualification routes over one year, because um, you can fit five qualification routes in. Um, and, and that isn't that different from what used to happen, because although eight standard grades was the norm, lots of kids had uh, moderated timetables, um, particularly looked after and accommodated children often had moderated timetables, to do with their attendance pattern and you know, behavioural issues in certain classes. So there was always flexibility within the system. Um, if the question is, in uh, do I think you could impose a system uh, on schools and say, this is what we want? Um, well, it's really tempting, right? But it's, 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 it would be going like, 
Yeah, but so, yeah, no, <laughs> get behind me, Satan. Um, you know, it's, it's moving in the wrong direction. So you, you cannot say you're going to have an empowered school system with greater you know, professional autonomy at school level and then dictate exactly what happens. I think there has to be... I mean, I genuinely think that um, Scottish Government, SQA and uh, Education Scotland collectively have not sent a, a coherent message around uh, the senior phase ambitions over the last few years. And we've had to spend a lot of time dealing with the fallout of the qualifications. So I think the last time I was here, we were talking about assessment overload, uh, both for teachers and for young people, in terms of trying to do six, seven, eight uh, N5s in one year. And, and, we, and we removed the units uh, to address that. Um, although in a two-year system, the units are perfectly fine. Uh, but that's one of the ironies that we've, we, we've taken those away. Uh, I, I think that there's probably a debate to be had um, around what is the best system. Um, and there's also scope, you know, so 2 plus 2 plus 2 is a kind of shorthand. There are a lot of schools who in S3 are doing BGE and also have an eye to what the senior phase is looking at. So that so S3, there shouldn't be, at the end of S3, you go into senior phase, there should be a conscious uh, transition across S3 preparing pupils for the senior phase. Um, and, and that might mean um, making sure that in, there's informed choices. Because I think, you know, science and, and languages uh, and history geography have suffered from the six qualification presentation in S4. Um, there was a debate last week in Parliament around subject choice. Um, just to be clear, pupils didn't actually have free choice under standard grade. They had to do English, they had to do maths, they had to do a science, whether they liked it or not. They had to do history, geography, and modern studies, whether they liked them or not. Uh, they normally had to do art, uh, drama, or uh, music, whether they liked it or not. And then, then there'd be a bit of choice around second sciences. So we used to be quite prescriptive uh, across standard grade around uh, the limit of pupil choice. Uh, and all of that is predicated on uh, staffing. Right? So no, I don't think anyone in this panel here would defend multi-level uh, teaching um, uh, in, in any subject area. The reason it happens is because in physics, they want to run advanced higher physics, so they put the kids in with a higher class because otherwise no timetable is going to timetable a class and a teacher for five pupils. Right? Or they're doing, they're doing higher N5 in the same class because it's the only way they can actually get to a viable class size. And that some of that is down to you know, teacher availability in certain subjects. Home economics has been, has been wiped out, um, not because pupils aren't choosing it, because they kind of get home economics teachers for loving their money. Um, but in some cases, it is down to the school having to make choices around how it allocates its staffing uh, pro rata to the number of pupils. So most timetables won't put a subject on the timetable unless there's going to be a minimum of 10 pupils in that class because otherwise um, they're losing staff in elsewhere, and that, you know, cuts the... So, you know, so in a, in a grand sense, all of that is about resources. But that issue around resources and class size has not come about because of the senior phase, because it was there before uh, when you were looking at intermediates and looking at hires. You still had to have viable class sizes to run them. And, and I know Ross isn't here, but his issue around schools that serve uh, areas of multiple deprivation have fewer choices. That's absolutely true, but it was true before the senior phase uh, as it is now, um, because the class sizes in the in the upper schools in those schools, uh, the, the stay on rate is, is lower in those schools, uh, so you have fewer pupils, uh, which dictates the kind of uh, subject choice you can offer them. Could I just come in quickly just to reiterate what, what Larry was saying about staffing? That staffing is one of the biggest issues that concerns all our members at the moment um, in different ways. Now, that there are some schools that have not replaced teachers for countless lengths of time. There are ch children sitting not being taught by, by specialist Gaelic teachers. So th this is a huge issue that needs to be, to be looked at. Um, other than that, you're looking at the issue of staff um, to be trained in Gaelic um, medium or Gaelic learners teaching. When we have less people coming out with Gaelic um, as the years go on, we're going to have a smaller skill set as the years progress. And we need to make sure that the staffing, if there are any gaps in staffing, if there are any lacks of, um, uh, lack of teacher training, this needs to be looked at so that we do have staff and that schools and authorities actually employ teachers the minute there is a gap. 
Ms. Kouris. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning to the panel. And uh, just to let members know, I, I did previously in a, in a prior life used to work with Marjorie Kerr at Education Scotland, just uh, for the record. Um, Larry, I want to go back to your point about uh, ambitions being missed around about curriculum for excellence. Um, and Marjorie, I note in the uh, SAGET submission, you speak about a return to the 222 model. Um, and I saw a tweet from Seamus Searson, uh, who's the General Secretary of the SSTA last week, who tweeted that it was time for two year courses, which sounds to me like a return to standard grade. And Larry, in your submission, you talk about the IS being of the view that the structure of the senior phase is mostly unchanged, and we've had that discussion already this morning. Do you think going back in time there was perhaps a cultural resistance within the secondary um, teaching population to change the way that we do things from standard grade because it was thought at the time that curriculum for excellence was perhaps more suited to primary? Um, I think Seamus's comment is around two-year courses across S4, S5, because I've had that discussion with SSTA. Um, there was a, a cultural resistance um, uh, because, you know, as I said earlier, teachers had become used to a system whereby uh, they were validated on the basis of how well their kids did in qualifications. So we'd had two decades of uh, the uh, SQA uh, league tables around how many hires you're, you're getting, your transition from S4 into from your standard gaze into higher. So our, our whole system was geared towards um, pupils achieving qualifications. And then we were trying to switch to a new system and we literally went from the new qualifications arriving in school um, post-Easter uh, for implementation in August. Uh, and no one spent any time uh, actually trying to discuss with schools what the change was. So the whole focus of schools was on um, how we minimise the change that is required that, you know, to deliver new qualifications uh, and ensure that pupils aren't disadvantaged by being the first cohort. So I, I described the model that we had in Hillhead. At one point, over half the schools in Glasgow were asking me to come out and speak to them about that model. And in the end, we were the only school that did it because the timetable was such that the only way schools could cope was by and large to stick with their current curriculum architecture and just change the, change the qualifications. And people worked, really, you know, teachers worked really, really hard over those first three years to make sure that young people weren't disadvantaged because when we introduced higher still, we did have, we did have young people being disadvantaged by the change. Um, so I, I would say that we, you know, collectively, we didn't take the time to actually get the message out into schools, um, which is why this thing was around. I mean, the point was made earlier around BGE coming in. I, I, th I saw in one of the space reports, I think it was saying when CFE was introduced in 2010, and you're going, no, it wasn't. That was when the qualifications changed. CFE was introduced well before that, but people still associate. CFE in the secondary school as I, was, I had changed how I taught my hire because of CFE long before the, the, the qualifications changed. But we really missed an opportunity. Now, why did that happen? Um, so I don't want to follow out with anybody, but it was because of the political noise around the qualifications. We were pressing uh, Mike Russell, who was the cabinet secretary at the time, for a, a year's delay in introducing the qualifications. Um, there had already been a year's delay a couple of years before that. Um, you know, to put it bluntly, uh, Mike got a kicking around the previous delay, you know, about why we're delaying these reforms. Um, the CFE management board, uh, with the exception of myself, uh, unanimously recommended that we should proceed with the timetable. SQA said it had delivered the qualifications, which it had. You know, they, they were there uh, on the shelf. Um, and none of the political parties would support a delay. Right? Tavish flirted with it, right? but in the end, uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't go with it. So there was no political will to delay. Um, so schools then had to cope with, but that's goodbye standard grade, hello, N4, N5. Um, and it's honestly only now that there's been a bit of heat taken out of the system that we're actually starting to address that missed opportunity. So that's why I think we are at a stage where, well, we need to decide, do we still have these big ambitions? 
Uh, and how do we move forward towards that? Um, because, you know, we made, we made a mistake, collectively as a system, we made a mistake in the way we introduced N4, N5. That has created some of the issues that have now been faced um, around subject choice restrictions, which weren't built into the system. And that's why I said they were unintended, but they weren't unforeseen, because um, people talk about 160 hours of notional. If you're a timetable in a school, 160 hours is not notional. If I timetable a maths uh, higher class and give them 100 hours, there'll be a delegation at my door saying, we can't deliver this in 100 hours. So 160 hours is what's needed to deliver the course. And you cannot fit, you can't even fit six times 160 into one year. The only reason some schools are doing that is because they're starting them in the middle of May, right? Kids finish their exams one day and they start their new course the next day. It's the only way that you can technically suggest there's six um, times 160. So, so we've got a, you know, we've got a situation which is clearly unsatisfactory in what we need to decide, which I think was actually the gist of uh, Lizzie's motion last week, um, how we move forward from where we are um, and, you know, kicking one another over how we got here isn't going to be that helpful. We just really need to think about what is the next step and how do we get there. Sorry, I'm sounding very preachy this morning. I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> I'm going to bring in Dr. Allen. <laughs> Thank you. I guess, Bajik and Farlamich, Ms. Nikifi, I guess, between the missions of Erlis and Louvre of Akershire. Um, can I ask about one of the things that you raised there, um, Ms. McPhee? And that was, um, I can, can I ask if you can separate out a couple of different things? You were talking about impacts of subject choice on Gaelic as. Gaelic learners and Gaelic fluent speakers, but also you, you were talking about the impact on education more widely through the medium of Gaelic. So can I ask you what what uh, impact are you are you drawing, or, or do, do you find in, in the issues around subject choice for Gaelic medium education specifically? Are you looking at Gaelic as a fluent language or Gaelic subjects through the medium of Gaelic? Subjects through the medium of Gaelic. Um, that is also a. That, what we need there, that there's in terms of the staffing, we need people that are willing to teach a subject because we are, there, it's few and far on the ground, but there are a number of schools that offer Gaelic medium and it is tremendously successful and it also adds to the, the fluency of children who are doing Gaelic medium. Um, but it it's almost works in partnership that the more children that have the opportunity to study um, geography, history, modern studies, maths, um, sciences, through the medium of Gaelic, then that obviously was, is going to increase their fluency and is going to increase things um, all round. There, there is a, a huge dearth of teachers that are willing, not only able, but willing to teach their subject through Gaelic. And therefore, that's got another impact that, that there is no question that we're going to have large numbers um, opting to do these subjects. But we need to start somewhere small. Um, the, Glasgow Gaelic School started small and have done a tremendous job. But we, you know we need to allow these things to happen rather than wait for the huge numbers to come because they won't come. So that's why we have that issue on on um, forms or on option forms or in schools that the options is having a, a strangling effect on the language in Gaelic learners and in Gaelic medium. Although they are quite different, it is having probably more of an effect on Gaelic learners than it is on on Gaelic medium because in Gaelic medium you have more of an investment by whether it be parents, the children themselves, to, to see things through, although some decide not to see things through, and that's another issue. But with Gaelic learners, that is an option, much like modern languages, whether it's French or German, that they opt. Um, and if something is not in a form, then they're not going to choose that if it, if it only appears once in a form or their numbers aren't large enough. Does that answer the question? It does. I spoke when you, when you uh, I speak, um, when you're talking about options and forms from the rather eccentric position that when I was... Uh, in second year at school, I drew an extra column on my choices and wrote Gaelic in, but it wasn't available. Um, but um, I, I suppose what I'm also driving at is you, you mentioned uh, almost a workforce planning issue there. Uh, how quickly do you think there would there would be a visible impact on some of the problems you've described with um, that workforce planning for the future, for the availability of Gaelic medium teachers? Um, were there not um, something done about this acute problem that we're facing just now around Gaelic? Yes, almost instant. 
There are teachers there. We, we, we need more teachers, but there are teachers out there. There are teachers that are available for jobs if they were advertised. That are, what, what we don't have is people that are perhaps, especially in the more remote areas, they do tend to suffer more because if there's people off on, on sickness or illness, there's not so much supply cover there. But there are that the, um, people have been making a tremendous effort to boost um, uh, teacher training and numbers coming out, and that has seen a turnaround. So we do have teachers out there. What we need to has is, is to have them in classes uh, with children in front of them actually teaching. Until that happens, then they can't impart their knowledge and, and um, have the Gaelic developing in that way there. So it could be instantaneous if everything worked together and, uh, and um, things worked to plan and you have a teacher in front of every class, every child that wants to learn Gaelic. Thank you. And this is uh, perhaps a question for you, but certainly one for uh, Mr. Valdera Gill. Um, you, you talked about the fact that we clearly can't go back um, to the past, but you, you did point to concerns that you had uh, about, I think, without putting words in your mouth, concerns you had about the, the lack of um, the compulsory nature of, of languages in, in, the early, in, in school. So where does the solution lie, in your view? Are you advocating something around subject choice, or are you advocating something around compulsory subjects, or, or where does the solution lie? I think um, I wouldn't advocate for, compuls for compulsion. Um, for, um, I think making place in the curriculum for it to happen. So if, if, if um, the, the course choices were not five, six, uh, a modern language could still be a viable solution for many students who want to study it. Also thinking that if we want to continue that breath in the senior phase, we need to think that if all of our European counterparts, 95% they do study a modern language in the equivalent of a senior phase and our students don't. So if we still want to say that the senior phase has breath, modern languages needs to be there. For me, there's two big, big issues is a lack of understanding, although it's very clear in policy, CFE, Principles and Practice Paper, uh, CEFR at a European level, of the role of modern languages, the role that is placed for literacy. To me, that is not um, totally understood by the profession. I, I work in teacher education. I also work with uh, teachers delivering the one plus two. And I can see that there are schools in Glasgow that are most deprived, the ones or that tend not to do the modern language, and that's a double whammy for children, because the 4,000 words in English that come from French, so if you, and, and, and it's through the learning of a language that our students are exposed to that. So for me, there's the issue of the literacy, and also, um, Larry and Katrina have talked about the the lack of alignment of curriculum, assessment, pedagogy. This is not only an issue for Scotland, this is an issue for every nation, so it's not just us. But um, thinking about qualifications in the senior phase, um, if I look at France, if I look at Spain, they are teaching languages through content language integrated learning. Uh, IDL is one, con is one of the contexts of learning for CFE, but once we get into the senior phase, that's forgotten. So the IDL happens in first to third year, maybe, or maybe not, but once we go there, it's not happening. There's no, there's no reason why the modern language could not be part of another qualification. It, there's no reason why it cannot be part of, of science or, ge or geography, of art, of any other subject. So um, SQA, I also have an SQA hat because I'm the principal assessor for higher Spanish. Um, so SQA has done this for the baccalaureate, where they were students, but it's taken by a very minority of students, but we could build on that and think that um, there are other ways of enabling, enabling young people from S4 to S6 to take a language. Um, there's a job to be done, but... Um, um, there are there are other ways if the curriculum in S4 cannot be changed. And finally, again for yourself, uh, one one issue that's been raised in the past with us, or certainly been raised publicly, is about the question of whether people who drop a language in second or third year are then taking it up in fifth or sixth year, and what what are the issues around that? I think there is a there is a notion. 
uh, in the four nations of the UK that people are just bad at languages. There's also the difficulty or the thought, the myth that a language is more difficult than another subject. It is not, uh, but whether we like it or not, that is a, a myth that people live with and that gives them, makes them not take, not take the subject. So the reality is that if the students do not follow it up, some of them might come back, but they don't. So that um, there's no reason why um, the students, they, they, I mean, in 2000, I've provided statistics, in 2011, 2012, there were 28,000 students doing, um, doing a standard grade French. We've got 6,000, 7,000 now. So there's no reason why these students could not come back in S5 and S6 to do a national five or a higher, but they don't. Um, so um, unless something is done in the system to try to get these students back, uh, is, is, is not happening. So the reality is that once it's dropped, um, fewer students come back to, to do it. Although it's not to say that they cannot come back. And certainly that assumption that you have to have a national, uh, that progression of national four, five, uh, higher or advanced higher, there, there are students who, have, who can crash a, a higher course without having done a national five, but this doesn't happen very often. Uh, so uh, I think there's work to be done in schools to convince the population and manage their expectations that languages can be done, uh, but um, the system has not allowed for it either. So it's a combination of both, I think. Thank you, you wanted to come in. Did you? Uh, Sorry. No, I had one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just interested in the, the question there, pupils who drop a language in second or third year. So that shouldn't happen, right? Pupils are not supposed to be dropping languages uh, until they get to the senior phase. Um, one of the debates around, you know, the, the six subject choices in S4 is that up until the end of S3, pupils should be studying 11, 12, 13 subjects. So instead of going to eight subjects to understand a grade, they're supposed to maintain all their subjects across S1, 2, and 3. Um, with, with some refinement in, for, in science, for example, they might move from general science to looking at specific, you know, f physics or chemistry. Or some, so some refinement is allowed in S2, but, but languages is one of the subjects that shouldn't be getting dropped. So across uh, S1 and S2, 3, the experiencing outcomes apply across the board except for where there's some degree of specialism with a view to the, the senior fates. Um, so we should actually have, you know, whether it's French or Spanish or whatever, uh, all pupils experiencing that at least up to the end of S3, which should be level three, level four. And the idea is at the end of S3, pupils should have sufficient grounding that somewhere in the senior phase, they can revisit the subject um, and have, have, you know, at least a foundation uh, there. Just come in quickly with that there, that, um, that what Fran was saying there about um, young people dropping, like them, them, especially Gaelic learners, um, does happen and it's obviously can come in at any point. There's quite a few more pupils that have been, have been doing Gaelic medium or Gaelic fluent that do actually come back in at the later school time. The, the point I wanted to make linked to what Larry was saying as well, though, is that what we have is a very, very, a system where, where across the nation it's quite, set, it's quite different and that's the problem. We have some schools that do allow um, pupils to opt after S2 some that do that, but they're still officially doing the BGE. Some that carry on with the, the whole BGE till the end of the S3. Other schools that actually allow um, early presentation where you have pupils actually doing um, their N5 exam at the end of S3, which is great for them. They only allow that to, that to happen if the young people are able to do so. But it means we have a system that is that is so varied across the country. And as they then opt for the senior phase, it's it's not a level playing field. It's Miss Watson. Can I just add in one point, um, it's an experience I've had say, within the last um, couple of years in a, a school where um, a science teacher was off long term sick. There are no temporary science teachers out there to come in and cover. So that timetable, essentially, the, the BGE classes, because obviously the accredited classes must be seen by the chemists. The BGE timetable um, had all the third year cohort uh, on it. And the uptake for the third year cohort in chemistry going into fourth year 
was something like, I don't, I don't even think they had enough to run a, a class of 20 because of the experience the youngsters have had through no fault of their own, not the department's fault. It's just circumstantial um, with regard to, you know, science teachers. There's not enough of them, so. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Mr Scott. Uh, thank you. Um, if it's any consolation, Francesco, my son's nine-year-old class can all pronounce the Christian names and the surnames of the Barcelona first team immaculately, as they were doing last night, although they all can sing You'll Never Walk Alone, but not in Spanish. Um, Tess, I, I wanted to ask you just, just in general terms, or if you've got specific data, that'd be helpful in terms of your organisation. This is about narrowing choice. I mean, we'll uh, take all the rest of the panel's observations about the wider themes of what's going on. But do you have a sense of what's happening in terms of the teaching of science in the senior phase? What the implications of narrowing choice are? Is that impacting on the choices and therefore the future direction of young people who, as you rightly said, you have a passion for making sure can <coughs> take science? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think... It, it, there's definitely impact there. There is absolutely. I mean, the specific school, I don't want to go into names, but the department are fantastic. Um, the, the youngsters that have the subject spe specialists, so if it's a biology class at accredited uh, stages, um, they'll have a biologist. If it's chemistry, they'll have a chemistry teacher, physics, and so on. Um, and, yeah, so it, 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 subject specialist it has to be... Um, and I think, I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your question here, but the, the BGE in physics and chemistry, and it's not just, this is quite prevalent in a number of schools, where because they can't get a subject specialist in, the BGE first year to third year go on to a non-subject specialist, or if there's no science teacher, it would be just general cover. And that, that experience is directly affecting the pickup of subjects um, across, well, it was chemistry, the particular um, example I was thinking of. So think less girls and boys are able to go into the senior phase now uh, who want to take our science discipline than, um, than some years back. It, has that narrowing of choice made it more difficult, do you think, to, to pursue a science career? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, probably more so with maths, um, physics and technologies. Um, I think very sensible kind of collegiate cross-party support for STEM subjects and particularly more women into science and so on and so forth. We're failing because why? We've not got enough teachers or what's your, what's your prognosis as, to, as the main problem? I don't think everyone will agree with me on this, no, but sure. um, I think that the shortage of teachers um, and attracting and retaining individuals in the profession, um, a figure just out of my head, last year I had 13 PGD biology students at Murray House um, who've all successfully gone on to do their NQT year. Five of them, once they've done their NQT year, are off to hit the international circuit. Okay. And I think that's probably quite telling. Um, not that it's, that's, This is probably not for a discussion today, but a lot of the co conversations I into, into in the staff room would be to opt for a four-day week with longer hours. But again, I think that's probably another de debate. For no, another day. And if there's no, any quite. primary teachers. So, but it's not necessarily about, I mean, I'm very interested in this take about 222 versus what we now have. It's not necessarily that. You think it's that there are other pressures there as to why we don't have enough, why we've got teacher shortages in your disciplines? I think, um, what, why have we got teacher shortages? Mm. I think, um, well, I've had two mature students leave the PGD uh, programme this year, and it's, they, they were incredibly capable very capable, um, who just not not for them. The the under uh, you know the, the pressures, the, the the having to conform, um, it, it it just wasn't for them. And I think that that's that is quite telling. Um, I, I, my honest truth here: if I was to go and do a PGDE without the experience I've got now, having ha had two young children, there's no way I could cope with that course. The course is it's very intense, it's very successful, and it prepares these uh, students for um, the profession as best we can. Um, and it, our, our evaluations have been good, but it's, you know, it's just indicative of the, the profession. T teachers are tired. Thank you for that. Um, Larry, can I just ask you, um, you've made uh, considerable much this morning of 
the need to, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you've argued in favour, in effect, of, of moving forward, not going back. I get that. So there must be two or three aspects to that argument which we've, we, we should see as a committee. I mean, what are the two or three aspects, or maybe there's more, but two or three aspects to um, uh, improving the situation so that just this narrow focus we've had in this inquiry on, on subject choice uh, starts to become addressed, um, and then broad on that, how do we how do we make sure that rationale for the senior phase that you articulated in your opening remarks is 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 enhanced? I think the starting point would be to decide whether or not we still believe in the ambition of breadth and depth and parity of esteem. Um, so if if those are uh, the outcomes we we desire, uh, we then have to think: well, how do we achieve that? And we don't achieve it if the bulk of our system is on a stepladder of qualifications. Um, so it's quite, you know, I, I can imagine for a pupil doing six subjects in, at N5 with, the, you know, the two-term dash and the, the, the focus on the qualification to be followed by five of those six subjects in uh, S5. Um, it's not a great learning experience, right? It, the message there is it's all about the qualifications. Now, it is a big jump for Scottish education to start talking about exit qualifications, and it will be quite a contested area, right? So I, I know a lot of our members, um, uh, you know, would sympathise with the idea of we should have certification in S4, um, and we should look at starting the courses earlier. Uh, I just think that boat has, has sailed, um, you know, and um, if we look at where we are, we can recognise that that is not a good learning experience for young people uh, and start to think about how we move it forward. But, you know, going back to Joanne's points earlier, there'll be young there will be young people in our system for whom uh, getting qualifications and doing a step and ladder approach is entirely the way that they should do it. Uh, you know, so they're getting success early. So, so that's asking for quite a lot of flexibility in our system, um, which is what the Empowering Schools agenda is meant to be about. Um, I think what has been missing um, is a clearer articulation around the, you know, the objective of the senior phase and what we want to see involved in it. Right? So, I, I, I think it's appalling that. Um, you know, we have young people who, beyond S3, are not being exposed to language. You know, you know how that can be equipping young people for the modern world uh, is beyond me. So I'm not saying we have to make it compulsory, but we do have to have a strong message around schools which are, are accommodating or are meeting the needs of young people will clearly be addressing the importance of language in the 21st century. So I think there have to be messages there. And then schools can look at, that, well, this is what we've been asked to do. Standard grade made it compulsory. Uh, so, you know, they had to do a certain range of subjects. I think rather than saying it should be compulsory, we should be, and this is what we expect our system to deliver for young people. And if you're doing a variation on that, that's fine, but justify it in terms of the needs of your pupils. Um, but that, that I think is, and I think it would be great if we could actually get uh, you know, a consensus around those objectives um, and then say to the system, this is what we want you to deliver. Uh, I do think it requires buy-in from all organisations and that includes SQA. Um, you know, so SQA, if they come here, will tell you they offer a vast array of um, qualifications beyond just, um, you know, N5, N6, which is true. And if you went to colleges, you'll see that them, those being deployed in colleges. Um, not so much in schools yet, unless it's a college school link up. But I do think we have to explore that. So, you know, languages can be done in, in more ways than just doing an N5 or a higher. Uh, crash course in Spanish in six year used to be one of the most popular choices uh, because um, young people wanted to acquire, uh, you know, that particular language because it suited their all the aspirations, um, you know, but, but it, it, it was a valid, you know, legitimate interest. Um, so I don't, I think some of the things we offer uh, don't have to necessarily be linked to qualifications. Um, but 
that's that's where we're. You know, I think that's where we are at the moment. I think reaffirming the, the objectives uh, and creating legitimate demands around what you know the kind of core uh, areas that we think think should be in the curriculum, mm -hmm. and then beyond that, saying to schools, this is what we expect to deliver, um, and have your story there if you're doing something different. Uh, and I think if schools do have a narrative around why they're doing something different, that's fine. Um, but we want we want to get away from, and this is a big change because there's reference made there to you know early presentation. When when we started doing CFE in the secondary school, we had a huge movement towards kids starting qualifications in S2 and setting their standard grades in S3. Um, so you know a kid who was at school for six years spent five years doing qualifications in one year getting used to the big school. Right? So we're trying to move totally away from that. Um, so that means putting the focus on qualifications at the exit point, you know, thinking in those kind of terms. I still think SQA could do more to ensure there's kind of better fallback in the system. Because I think that is one of the barriers that the safety nets aren't there, um, you know, to, to make sure that nobody is disadvantaged. Um, so that, that's an area that, I don't want to advocate more changes from SQA, but that's certainly an area that needs to be uh, looked at. We've talked a lot today about curriculum architecture and, and um, course choice, but one of the things we haven't really uh, touched on, which uh, we feel quite strongly about in geography, is that the way that schools are organised now. And one of the things um, that our members are quite passionate about is the loss of principal teachers of geography. Um, many local authorities have gone over as a cost-cutting exercise to faculties. Um, and so some faculties are um, social, social subjects where um, you may have history, geography, modern studies, RMPE all in one faculty, and the head of faculty is not your subject. So if we say it's not geography because that's what I am, um, instinctively, you are not going to give the time to geography as you are to history or modern studies, whatever your, your actual subject is. Um, and so sometimes we find then that there are, if the, the head of faculty is history, there are more history teachers because that's what becomes more popular. And so there's a, a pushing out of um, some of the subjects. Um, and so, you know, the, we, you may end up, you talked about having a non-specialist. Um, some schools then go over to integrated social subjects, which is, again, something that we don't advocate. Um, we feel that, you know, a teacher should be teaching, if they're a geography teacher, they should be teaching their subject, which is geography. Um, but again, if you've only got one geography teacher in the faculty and five history teachers or whatever it is, um, that's what you have to do. Um, I'm also interested to hear about the fact that you, the STEM subjects are struggling for um, teachers because one of the things that we also feel is that we've tried for a number of years to have geography included in STEM because geography is partly a science subject. There are two parts to geography. There's human geography and physical geography. Um, and we have not been allowed to be part of that. Um, in the new uh, regional improvement collaboratives, for instance, there's going to be um, people who are development officers in literacy, numeracy, STEM, ICT. Um, there's also the two plus one languages. Social subjects gets nothing. Social subjects has been completely pushed to the side and left out. We don't. We have now. Um, in Education Scotland, we have one person um, who is supposedly developing the whole of the social subjects curriculum for the whole of Scotland. So we definitely just feel that we are being, um, you know, marginalised, um, not just by course choice, but by the way the system is um, operating at the moment. Thank you. Mr. Felderico. Yes, can I it's just comments with colleagues here? I, um, for, with my initial teacher education hat as well, I would I would say what I would say the same that Marjorie is saying. Not having faculties, um, not having principal teachers, has an effect on the support some student teachers get when they are out in placement. 
Um, with the, with with Larry, with the, the idea of having better safety nets in the system for 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 modern languages, this exists for National Four and National Five, and still has not helped. Um, uh, has not helped the case of, of modern languages. So e even if that was there, something uh, uh, more uh, radical, and I, and I like your idea of reaffirming objectives and what is expected. Um, uh, I'm part of a, of a, of a, a research group in, in, in Wales uh, looking at the, at, the, at the national qualifications uh, and, at the, at, and the assessment. And um, the question that we started when we started working with teachers is what do we want a Welsh person to, look, an educated Welsh person to look like by the time they're leaving school when they're 16? And uh, yes, there will be some students who live at 16, there are others that live at 18, but I would say that um, a modern language should be part of, of that. It shouldn't be just something that a small minority are doing. And um, also research shows that that minority that is doing, who is doing a modern language is also linked to social status of, of the students doing the language. So that is more dangerous for, for our future as a nation as well. And also with uh, kind of going back to Dr. Allen's question, um, with the one plus two policy, uh, it was envisaged in 2010 or 2011 that the one plus two policy, and it's written in the policy, would have a knock-on effect on the uptake of modern languages. And uh, that has not been realized. And it was thought back then of thinking, uh, asking, asking future teachers to have the equivalent of a, of a higher to entry into the teaching profession. We, we asked for a higher English, a national five maths. Uh, other European counterparts do ask for their initial teacher uh, education courses for students to have uh, the equivalent of a higher a CFRB in, in a language that had to be dropped. And in, not to say that it could happen in the future, but the way things are going, we're farther away from, from, from the realization of that because of what is happening in the senior phase. Okay, Ms. Watson. Yeah, just to say that I completely echo Marjorie and Francisco's comments there, um, in particular with the, the, the restructuring of jobs and the way that the, the uh, schools um, have their, their hierarchy. Uh, when I started teaching, uh, each science had a principal teacher um, and your principal teacher was biology, physics, chemistry. Um, and you would usually have in school as well an assistant principal teacher in science, which was a fantastic little post um, dealing with first and second year science at the time in schools. That then moved to the curriculum leaders posts. Uh, there was a lot of unrest in a lot of schools because inevitably, if you had three principal teachers, they would be on conserved salary, but one of them would inevitably get the, the science job. Um, and to, to echo what Fran... Francisco Fran say, um, student teachers, I, um, I think I must have been in around 40 schools within two years um, and the, 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 the support that student teachers get is very, very varied, very varied um, and for young, um, well young in their uh, career I may add, um, it's, it's not a particularly um, positive positive outlook for them. They, they, you know, this is the, them learning about the profession. It's hands-on and at their first uh, placements, either being given the placements late by the student placement system with the General Teaching Council, um, or um, they haven't been allocated a mentor. These were the, the, the two things that were, were reoccurring and um, it creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety for me because I, I get worried for them. Um, and I just, yeah, I think that maybe may well be something that, to look at. Okay, uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Flanagan, you said something very interesting uh, earlier about the a very few number of schools who are um, using the fourth and the fifth year uh, very much as a two year uh, progression. Can I just be uh, very clear about what happens in these schools? Namely, at the end of S3, uh, young people would make a decision about whether they're going to do a two year higher and sit it in S5, uh, or whether they take uh, a national. Uh, five course or uh, other courses. I is that a correct understanding of what happens in these schools? Um, well, it may vary from school to school. 
um, the in Hillhead, the, the one that I'm familiar with, uh, the final decision around N5 higher would normally be made at the end of S4. So the initially they would go into a, a depending on the subject obviously, but they would go in based on their S3 uh, CFE outcomes. They would go into a N4 course, a straight N5 course, or N5 stroke higher course, and uh, one of the things the school is very keen to do is over the course of S4, uh, evidence what is the best qualification for the young person to go to. So one of the things they did, for example, was to introduce an S4 uh, mini exam diet so that there was concrete evidence there um, to persuade parents as to what course they should, what qualification they should sit. Uh, the school errs on the side of caution, so they don't do aspirational presentations. Uh, you're presented for the course, the qualification that the school is confident you will get, uh, and so far no one's fallen through the net. So, you know, this, this parent might come up and say, I want them to do higher. Uh, the school's quite firm in saying there's no evidence that the person can achieve the higher, so they'll be doing the N5. There's two other uh, questions about that um, uh, model. Is it correct that uh, if youngsters did do uh, a National 5 qualification, that then they could put together their fifth and sixth year to do a higher over two years? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of flexibility uh, within the system. So because it's across three years, um, although the, the norm for most pupils from S3 would be to, to do a two-year course, uh, because you're also catering for a six-year, some of whom will have hires, you also will be running one-year courses at N5 and higher. Um, so you could have an S4 pupil in with S6 pupils in a one-year course. So let's say you had a particularly brilliant student who wanted to do hires um, in S4, then within your timetable you would have those options there. Uh, so that the, although the bulk of pupils were looking at two-year courses, it's not an absolute given, uh, depending on the potential ability of the, of the student. So, so one-year courses are part of the mix uh, in terms of the three years of the senior phase. Really, and, and did I pick you up correctly when you said that in these few schools, uh, they're offering uh, a column structure of seven and or eight subjects? Uh, the, so the, it's, most of them use an eight column structure, which is the, the old standard grade structure. Uh, generally speaking, it's five or six qualification routes. And then in the other two columns, you would have things like um, college courses, um, short, short module courses, um, alternative qualifications like DLV or Princess Trust, um, and also things like um, you know, IDL uh, projects or community link up. So the, so the breadth is not around eight qualifications, it's around a much broader experience. Um, uh it, modern apprenticeships also. Assuming that we are trying to uh, move on to, to, to take the, the good aspects of the change, the actual um, philosophy of behind curriculum for excellence, which all political parties have bought into, uh, and ensuring that there is that breadth, but also uh, that we're trying to make things more flexible and to increase the uh, subject choice availability so we don't uh, discriminate against uh, languages or STEM. Do you believe that the model in these few schools uh, is worth looking at to Im improve the situation and to avoid this, what seems to me is a complete disconnect in many schools between uh, BGE and the senior phase. I mean, is that model something that we should be looking at as improving the system? Yeah, I, I think um, looking at two-year courses uh, is absolutely the, the, the way forward. Um, I don't think it has to be a prescriptive uh, arrangement because depending on your pupil cohort, um, you might have to have a mixed economy around that. So there are qu quite a number of schools who offer two-year courses for uh, for straight higher candidates, um, you know, and, and they bypass N5, um, but they don't offer it for all pupils. So, you know, it can be a mixed economy, and I think you do have to, and this is why, you know, I think it's the empowering schools agenda is important. You do have to tailor it to the needs of your particular pupils. So if you, you know, if you're a scheme school in Glasgow, you, you maybe won't be offering bypass, but maybe you will, right? So uh, Govan High, uh, under the old system, Govan High used to mix 
all its post S3 pupils into short one year courses. Um, and it was all focused on maximising the qualifications for those young people, most of whom are going to leave uh, either in 16 in the summer or 16 at Christmas. So it, it had a particular model for the pupils in the community it was served. I entirely accept that. I think that flexibility is right. But it just seems that that uh, system that um, these schools are operating does offer greater choice um, within the core subjects. Uh, and as I say, not to discriminate against uh, those pupils who feel that they have to drop uh, science or languages because in, in, in the six subject scenario, that's obviously by the evidence we've had at this committee what's happening. You know, frankly, there are only two choices. Um, either you do S3, S4, and you then maintain, you know, eight columns across those two years, or you look at eight columns across S4, S5. Because if, if we're going to have S4 presentations as a norm, then we're not going to get beyond the six subjects. Right, so th those ones who are doing seven or eight are either cheating S3 or they're cheating S4. Um, but that is that is about all the problems around the two-term dash, and it's all about assessment. Um, and, you know, subjects like uh, geography, history, sciences, languages will be squeezed out um, if, if you go down to five or six choices early in the, early in the programme. That's why I'm, I favour the two-year course S4, S5, because that's where our pupils are physically now in that, in that um, staying-on uh, arrangement. And if you think across S4, S5, we can retain um, pupil choice, subject choice in a much more meaningful way um, than the kind of hybrid we've got at the moment, which was just born out of the practical need to uh, make the changes without uh, damaging uh, the pupil's potential uh, outcomes. I, I just think it, it manages to uh, achieve a lot of the objectives that I think we all uh, agree with, that you are allowing greater choice and uh, greater um, individual uh, attention within the curriculum, which is not always the case in some of the um, restricted scenarios that we have. And I think that's perhaps where we should be going. Thank you. And it is the finished system, so. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Watson. And I, I'm sure some of you will be familiar, but um, the National 5 qualification, you can sit units only and you'll still be accredited for that on your final certificate. Thank you. Uh, move to Miss Harris. Good morning, thank you. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I asked the panel whether courses were capable of sustaining multi-level teaching whilst man maintaining strong educational standards. Now, the answer was really a resounding no, and I know we have discussed on that and touched on this already this morning, but I really would like to put that the same question to yourselves, especially in light of the evidence from the Scottish Council of Deans of Education and also what we've heard from Francisco this morning, where, you know, we're discussing teachers having to teach, you know, National 4, 5, higher and advanced higher in one class. So wh what would you say to that, please? I definitely know. The SQA qualifications are not aligned to be taught that way. Um, in geography, um, if you have, for instance, National 5 and higher, um, your higher kids are the ones who are going to get your attention. Um, so you would spend most of the time teaching them. Um, and then you have to make up individual booklets, perhaps, for the National 5 pupils so that they can work on the parts of the course that are not aligned. So we find particularly um, that our National 5 pupils are definitely disadvantaged if they end up in a higher class because the, the courses do not match up. I'm going to be a little bit controversial. <laughs> now, in, in languages, the qualifications do align. You're teaching listening, talking, reading, and writing, and, and you can differentiate by level of outcome. So it can happen. Is it for the, and, and there are, and there are advantages of having higher or advanced higher students in the, in the same class. That, 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 that was the rationale of some schools putting S4, S5 and S6 students together with the socio-constructivism idea of learners learning from each other. However, it, it requires a level of preparation that at the time 
teachers do not have. It requires a lot more pedagogical uh, knowledge and understanding in languages how to make that work. And um, I would say that in the majority of cases it does not work because once some students get the N3 or F or N4 qualifications in, uh, we've ticked the box and then we concentrate more on the students who are going to have the exam in May, which sends a totally wrong message to the students in that class that are doing the national three and four. So um, for, for, for languages, it, it, it could work, um, but um, um, it is not always for the best of, of, of the students. Just echo what Fran is saying there that um, it is not it adds to workload it adds to planning unfortunately most of, of um, the Gaelic teachers especially in remote areas have to accept that because they want they want to teach children if somebody wants to come you'll take them in because you're not going to refuse them but it shouldn't be done for reasons of budget that's the thing with very careful planning it might work but it's 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 it is a huge amount of work, and, and it's, it's really not a, 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 a policy. Well, certainly for languages, it, it can work, but it's not something we would advise. The, the advice would be, no, try not to accept that at all. But when you're faced with, that, with somebody at your door who wants to do the language, then you let them in. So it happens, unfortunately, but it's not um, what we would like to see. Thank you. Ms Watson? Um, in the sciences, certainly, um, the, the continuity of the courses um, has improved since Intermediate 1 and 2. The, the Intermediate 1 and 2 were completely separate courses. Um, but what my experience with bi-level teaching is, as we've said, the workload, the preparing the resources, you're literally spinning two plates at one time. Um, I would say the biggest problem I've actually encountered is this shoehorning of, of students into the class. They don't actually want to be there, they're maybe the national fours, um, and that then has an impact on the, the children that do want to be there. Um, and it, it just, it's, it's, it's well, it's, it's money, it's, it's tight, and that's, that's the way it is. I don't know how you deal with that other than recruit more teachers. Thank you. Very few pedagogical advantages to multi-level qualification teaching. Um, but to separate that out from mixed ability teaching um, in the BGE, because that would be the single and cheapest way of actually narrowing the attainment gap to have more effective multi uh, mixed ability teaching. The challenge in the qualification routes is that, particularly in content heavy subjects, uh, you, you don't have the skills crossover that you might have in language or even in English. Uh, you actually have content which has to be covered. Um, so you, you are effectively running two courses in the same classroom um, with two cohorts or three cohorts of teachers. Um, and it, it does create a workload agenda then for teachers just to be able to cope. But inevitably it also alters the dynamic in the classroom because you're giving one set of pupils some work to do whilst you teach the other set, and then vice versa. And if you if you don't have an even balance, then the majority inevitably will see themselves as the class and the minority will feel that they're being tucked in at the end. Um, and it's maybe slightly different at advanced hire because at advanced hire, one of the uh, outcomes is that there's more independent learning on the part of the student. So, you know, advanced hire, I would run an advanced higher English class in my higher English class because, by and large, um, the, you know they're working on their own, um, and you know, it's not teacher-led uh, um, uh, learning. Um, but I, I think if if I was to cite one of the single biggest complaints that we've had from members um, around the senior phase, it's been the explosion in uh, multi-level classes. Uh, with the, all the attendant problems that brings, um, a lot of it workload, but a lot of it just around the manageability of the class and the fact that, it, by and large, it is a poor experience for all of the students in the classroom. Uh, so I don't think anyone would advocate it. It's simply a pragmatic response to uh, the limited resources that schools have to, to run the courses. Okay, thank you. Well, I think... You know, I think you're really saying the same as the other panel. Whilst I understand what you're saying with regard to languages, 
the theory might be one thing, but the practical aspects of it are not. It's, 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 it wouldn't be the choice of most right. teachers, but, yeah. but if you've got two students who want to do it, you're not yeah. going to say no to them because you're course. thinking of them. Yeah. So but it wouldn't be the choice. Yeah, I'm still hearing the same thing. Well, I was actually going to go on and ask you about the impact of teacher staffing levels and whether this did have an impact on the frequency of using multi-level classes, but I think you've really actually all answered that without me having to actually ask any further than that. But maybe if I could just ask you further, going forward then, do you see a growing a growing need for using multi-level classes the way things are currently with teacher staffing? Preferably not. I know preferably not, but... Do you, do you that's thing. It's, it should never be a need. Uh -huh. That's fine. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Lamont. Yeah. It was on, well, on the question of explosion of multi-level classes, first of all. To what extent is that a response to necessity or it's become an opportunity for some head teachers? You know what I mean? Larry uh, Flanagan talked about scheme schools, which is maybe a term that um, I would recognise from the past. A lot of the schools... You know, it's maybe just about disadvantage. And I think there is a challenge in a school where there's a smaller top end, although more youngsters are staying on than in, in my day. Um, I wonder how you... So I want to ask about this explosion of multi-level thing briefly. Are head teachers taking the opportunity to corral smaller subjects into a place where they have to have multi-level, which then frees up other bits, you know, head teachers who really don't see why you should be sitting with a class of 10 when somebody else is sitting with a class of 20 or 30. So is there an opportunistic thing there which is driving geographies to modern studies together and then if one of them doesn't survive, it doesn't really matter and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy? Or is it driven by just the reality there are not enough teachers in STEM? Or, and are, you, are you concerned that the former may be driving a lot of the decisions around the curriculum? I, I think... One of the unfortunate aspects of uh, CFE is that it has been introduced at a time of significant austerity. So some of the issues that people associate with CFE are actually to do with budgets. Um, uh, I think 99.9% .9 of head teachers would be happy to run uh, classes if they had the staff uh, there. But um, most local authorities have uh, cut their staffing formulas um, over the period of austerity. So, you know, most staffing formulas operate on the basis of a core staffing, then a multiple of the number of pupils, um, with some additions around deprivation. Uh, so, if you have fewer teachers, then you know you are going to be trying to cut your cloth. Um, if you're keen to retain certain subjects, um, and it doesn't always come from the head teachers. Sometimes it'll come from where they still exist, uh, subject PTs. So you know, a physics PT might say, uh, I'll run these two courses because they want to offer the options. Um, but in a lot of schools, there'll be only one or two physics teachers. Uh, so it, it's, a, I think it's, a very, it's very much a pragmatic response um, to pr primarily the financial pressures uh, that have been in the system for the last few years. And there's a very specific issue, I think, uh, Joanne, around um, the recruitment and retention of teachers in maths and sciences because uh, a lot of the graduates in these areas have had um, better career prospects uh, out with teaching. So, um, you know, the, the, the pay element uh, we've addressed, there are still issues around workload and so forth that uh, undermine teaching as an attractive profession. So if you want to stop, you know, the, 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 the graduates going into the international market uh, where they get better resources and, and, and better pay, then we need to still address some of those out, outstanding issues. I want to just look at that in terms of equity then. That, that head, I mean, way back in the day, wasn't a golden castle on the hill, but you had principal teachers of geography, we had principal teachers of German, even, you know, and you could see why rationally from a budgeting point of view you wanted to collapse these together. Is there a danger in, that in some schools, which are already disadvantaged, that collapse is more extreme? Uh, and, ab absolutely. And, so absolutely. What, do you do, what do you do about the young person who's more than capable of doing five hires, is more than capable of coping with a spread of academic subjects, but is in a school that you described as where there are other pressures because young people are disadvantaged? How do you... Where is that? Was it, uh, the equity argument one is the one that really disturbs me because the solutions 
that you need to get five hires if you're living in some areas in Glasgow will be to go to a college or will be to go to, and consortiums are not new, I accept that. But it's, that's not a solution that's required in some schools where in fact they'll have 30 youngsters who are working at A level in higher and another class that's working. You know, again, it's not new, but what is the response to that in terms of equity? Well, you can end up in a school where you, you don't get the breadth because the head teacher's making their judgment about what they consider to be more important, whether you get to do geography or history, um, but also um, you're fewer young people who are going to be operating at your, your level of ability. Uh, I, I think, uh, first of all, I think faculties have been uh, a disaster um, for uh, subjects in the secondary school, uh, and yet there are still some councils, uh, Dundee, uh, who think they're a good thing and are about to introduce them. Um, we are looking at career pathways, I think the report's due out shortly, which is looking at um, recreating some posts around pedagogical leadership so that uh, subjects have champions within schools, um, which I think is important uh, in relation to their place in the, in the, the curriculum. Uh, on the equity issue, uh, we have to ensure that schools which serve areas of multiple deprivation have the additional finance ne that they need to offer the same range of options as other schools. It doesn't mean you can offer everything because no school can offer everything, but they shouldn't be curtailing the pupil choices simply because they don't have the resources for the extra teachers. So if it means that they are running smaller classes um, because of the size of the school, then we should be looking to support that. Um, one of the issues around the PEF funding, which obviously is factored on supporting schools um, serving areas of, of multiple deprivation is that um, that doesn't really impact significantly in terms of your ability for uh, major staffing. So, you know, there is quite a lot of it's gone in additional support for learning needs or gone additional PSAs. Um, but it, to put in two or three extra teachers would be a law, would be beyond PEF funding for most schools. And that's where, if you go back to, um, uh, as, as we both do, to the days of the regions, one of the things that Strathclyde Region was quite good at doing was actually um, directing resource to areas of uh, uh, deprivation um, so that they were able to maintain uh, a full range of, of options. Uh, so I, I think that is a, it is a challenge because um, you know, the regions had a, a, an economy of scale that the 32 authorities don't have. But there really needs, I think the deprivation factor in the way schools are staffed has to be enhanced to ensure that the equity issue can be addressed. Can I just ask on that then, is it kind of a, a model of areas of priority treatment, but PEF money rather than being used for extras would actually explicitly be directed towards more teaching and staffing resource in, in schools of deprivation? I would. I would actually take it away from the PEF funding because of the, you know, the, the nature of that. I think we, that councils should be looking at their staffing formulas and what weighting they give to uh, deprivation mm -hmm. and how they staff their schools. So it's about core funding for the school in terms of its staffing structure. Um, uh, because I don't, I don't think PEF, uh, I know we have a commitment for the next couple of years, but I don't think PEF isn't core funding. Um, and I don't think a school should be reliant on mm. PEF for what should be a core service. I suppose what I meant was if the government wants to direct resource towards need in that way, would it be better to stop the PEF process, but actually say this is about core funding, but it's got to be actively used within deprived communities? Um, do I think the government should ring fence funding for education and tell the councils? Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe take the fifth in that one. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think it has the to be. The funding streams that they're accessing, because currently they've, they've got this money, which is badged as pay from this instability and can't be used for core business, which they might easily direct towards core budgets to local authorities, um, with the expectation, but if not, compulsion to be spent in education. We had um, not that long ago. We had a, a major fight. Um, and we got the Scottish Government to commit to protecting teacher numbers. And they ring-fenced the money for teacher numbers uh, and then had a major fight with COSLA 
who were unhappy at the ring fencing being put in place. Uh, but without that ring fencing, we would have lost teachers. So, you know, there, there is a big political debate in there between, uh, you know, local government and their autonomy around their own budgets um, and the funding for education. Um, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't think there's an easy solution to that because I think councils should be in charge of their staffing formulas. Um, but I think the funding they get should be sufficient to make sure that they can address the issues of deprivation in their staffing arrangements. Ms McPhee, you want yeah, to, it's to address a bit more into funding, which I wasn't going into there, but I mean, you were asking about the solutions to, to um, schools where there, maybe there are just you know one or two teachers. This is a, a particular problem in um, smaller schools when you have certainly just one teacher in a department and one route that has been taken. Um, it's a, it's a new one, but it's, it's looking at the, the virtual learning academy when pupils, if it is smaller numbers, they can hook up with, with um, other schools that are delivering at the same time. So that has been a solution for a number of schools. Um, how viable it is across the board, I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but it certainly has been a solution for a number. Um, can I thank all the pa panel members for the attendance at committee this morning? It was very helpful. Our next session on the inquiry will be on the 15th of May, and I now suspend for a few minutes before we move to private session. <laughs>